Welcome back to London. Nice to see you all again. Uh, third stream from the UK headquarters of Keywise. Um, I'm here with Ian. Welcome, Ian. Uh, Ian's going to do an awesome presentation today. I've seen a sneak preview. Um, he's going to do an awesome presentation on testing in TM1. Something that's always an afterthought, but it's super important. Um, and Ian's got a cool solution for that. So, yeah, without further ado, Ian. Yeah. Thank you, you Simon. All right. So, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen here and away we go. We go share that. Okay. All right. So, automated testing in Arc. Um, let's get started. So, I suppose those of you who uh, see me talk about this kind of stuff before know I care about testing a lot and know I think it's really important. But um, I guess what, why should we care and why do we care? The the important thing to understand with TM1 is it's it's an agile way we build stuff. So it's really easy to, to build stuff and throw stuff up and get to naught to somewhere really, really quick. It's also really easy to test that as you go along. Um, so you can build a TI process, you can run some data, and you can look in the cube and you can see that's work, that's done. And then you move on to your next thing. So, so testing is at once in TM1 really, really easy, but also it's really, really difficult because of the agile nature of building stuff. We can build a lot and then we can kind of forget exactly what we've built and, and all of the intricacies in the, the model that we've done. So wholesale testing and regression testing is hard to do. There's no structure or uh, tools in place for us to do that at the moment. Um, and we care about that because obviously we want TM1 models to be really, really good. So we care about the quality of it and we care about how developers can improve that and how developers can test as they go along and, and build quality models. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to do a couple of quick definitions on what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the day, and then I'm going to go into a demo of how our Compulse can, can help that. So bear with me at the start. It gets a bit wordy at the start, um, but it's really simple, and we'll, we'll catch up and start showing some cool stuff in a minute. Okay, so the first book is a textbook definition of what a unit test is. So I went and grabbed this out of a, a testing textbook. It's really, really wordy. You can read it, um, you know, in computer program, blah, 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 blah. Really what that means is, does this thing that I built do what I think it does? Does it always do what I think it does, no matter how many times I do it? And does it break something else that somebody else has, somebody else has built? Those are the three things what I'll focus on with, with the test that I'm going to show you today, uh, making sure that the thing works and it works every time. There's um, four components of a unit test. So when you're building a unit test, you've got to think about the setup. What is the starting environment of this test? So in some cases, it can be there is no data in a cube. In other cases, it could be the dimension exists, but it doesn't have the element that I'm going to try and insert into that dimension. It can be a very multiple uh, different environments or different setups that you do. So when you're building your test, you want to write the setup so you can control the environment that you're testing. And then you do something. And this can be running a process, a chore, entering data into a queue, but there's, there's some action that happens. Uh, and then you've got the assertions, um, which is what most people think of with the test. The assertions are, which we'll come on to later, the actual, you know, did this thing do what I expect it to do? And then afterwards we clean up. So if you're doing an example of, I'm testing whether or not my TI process inserts an element into a dimension, um, you might want to then delete the element at the end of it because you were just using a test element or something like that. So it's important to clean up after your tests as well and restore the model to the point where you think it should be normally. Um, while I'm here, I might as well do a textbook definition of an assertion. Um, so again, textbook definition, wordy, wordy stuff. Um, you can read it if you really want to, but it's pass or fail stuff at the end of the day. The assertion has to be a tick or a cross. It either passes or it fails. And in what we're going to show you today, the assertions can be a number of things. Uh, but in the examples that I'm going to show you today, the assertion is generally going to be, is this number in this cube what I expect that number to be? Um, it either is or it isn't. Um, so a couple of examples of what, what, what I'm going to run through in a bit. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a test for populating a consolidation element in a, in a dimension. So the setup would be, we're going to create an element in the department dimension called test. So you go in, manually put this element in the department dimension, and then you run your process. And your process is the thing that we're trying to test. So the process is supposed to allocate uh, leaf level elements in a dimension to consolidations. And the output of that thing, that the assertion, the binary true or false test that you want to do is, is this test element 
allocated or a child element of the unallocated consolidation. That's what the process is supposed to do. That's what you want to test. It's either a true or false. And then the cleanup, as the example would be, is we'll delete that element from the department dimension because it's not supposed to be there. Okay, an example of a general ledger load one, um, which I think is the actual example we've got in coming up, is if we clear out the general ledger cube, there's nothing in that general ledger cube, we start from, from fresh, empty cube, and then we just run our process to load that data. So something that everybody's built lots of times, we're in the process to load the data, and the expected outcome, because we know from the business, we've, we've looked at the raw data before, we know the expected outcome is gonna be revenue in March 2023, is gonna be 100, uh, thousand and the bank balance in February is going to be 999 and we're not going to do a cleanup because that's the state of the model that we want in the end is the data is loaded now we know the the March revenue and the February bank balance because they're set we've looked at the data source we know what those things is when you're in production or development those numbers might be different so you might be testing a different number of production or development but it's the understanding of the data and the understanding from the business of what those numbers are is what we're testing uh, a final one would be something which would, would be testing a rule. So in this instance, there is no process to run. We don't do anything. But the setup to that is we enter a currency attribute, and most of you have heard written a currency calculation before. So the, the currency used by ABC Limited will set that to be GBP. And we don't do anything. We don't run a process. We just then look at the data in the queue because there's already data in the queue. And we just make sure that that rule is working, that local equals GBP. So the number that's in local equals GBP because it's a one-to-one -one currency calculation. If that's that's the same, we know that rule is working, then we can go back and we can enter USD as the currency attribute for the company because it was USD to start with. So we clean ourselves up and we just test by flicking those things on and off. It's kind of thing that we do manually a lot when we're building stuff. You've got your rules and you've got your uh, queue view next to each other. and You change the rule, just make sure that the queue view works. But that's a one-off. And what we're trying to do with what we've built in Arc is have that so it can be replicable and actionable and everybody can share the tests and we know that those things always pass as we're building other stuff. Okay, so how can Arc and Pulse help in this environment? Um, the first thing is that we've tried to do this for a developer. So when you guys are developing and building stuff, you can also do your testing and write your tests in the same space. So we as developers live in Arc, We'd write the tests in Arc as we go along, and then we can action those tests again and again and again. And we can prove the results and we can run the same tests, and we don't have to come back in the next day, open up the cube view, and look at the same cube view just to make sure things happen. We can just run the tests and know that the tests are looking at the cube views or looking at the dimensions or looking at whatever else things that we, we've defined as a test. We can just run it and know that we get green lights or the tests are, are passing. We just want to restore those tests. So if we store the results of those tests, we can track our progress throughout and just make sure we know when the test started to fail. Or we can use those test results to say, we're happy now with what we've got. We can promote that to production and we can use Pulse to help validate that we've tested stuff. I mean, that, that's one of the important things with, with testing as a, a former practice manager. I'd like to know that stuff has been tested. And normally that's a manual process. The, you have to ask the developers if they've tested stuff, and they would say, yes, of course, they've tested stuff, but they can't show it and prove it. What we're trying to do is prove that the testing to give us, the developers, the customers, everybody confidence that something has been tested, and we can hand over a testing schedule and say, this is what we have tested, this is what works. The other thing that we're trying to do with this is have non-invasive tests. So we're not writing the test within the code itself, within the TR code itself. We're not adding objects to TM1. We're not adding things in the model itself. We're just having non-invasive tests that we come in, we connect, we execute or we read something, and then we, we go out. So we're not building stuff in a TM1 model. We're not adding stuff to an existing TM1 model to do the test. We're just testing what exists at the moment. Okay, so now time for a demo. I'm gonna jump into Arc, which is a, a new version of Arc that I've got installed. And we're gonna run through just what this stuff looks like and how this stuff works in practice. Okay, so here's Arc. Um, let me just refresh that and make sure I'm logged in because we are doing this live, so you can see Arc is running up. And what you'll see here is I've got a TM1 server called TM1 Server 01. I've connected Arc to Pulse, so this is Arc Plus. This is connected to a Pulse environment, which is monitoring Arc, um, which means I've got the new test center, which is in the latest version of Arc Plus, um, which is available, I think it's available in quarter four of this year, it's coming out. But here's the test center. Um, and what we've got at the moment is 
the tests. So what you'll see here is uh, a collection of tests or test collections, unit tests or categories of tests. Working from right to left, I'll just explain what these are. Categories are just buckets that we put tests in to help us understand what we're testing. So we, you know, we've got a load of tests which relate to bedrock. I just flag them as bedrock as I create the tests, so I can I can see and I can categorize these things. The unit tests themselves are, as I say, unit tests. They're testing a particular thing. Um, so in most instances, it's testing a rule or a process or a chore or something like that. But it can be a combination of different things. And then the test collections are how I want to execute those tests. So collection is obviously a collection of tests. So you can see here that in my GL module, my general module, module, I've got a number of tests that I want to run as a collection for that module. So in this instance here, I've got, uh, I'm going to build the cost dimension. I'm going to test the build of the cost center dimension and hierarchies. I'm going to test the build of the account hierarchies just to make sure they're building and they're, you know, what they're supposed to be. Uh, then I'm going to import some general ledger data. I'm going to import some KPI assumptions. I'm going to import some general ledger calculations. And then my final test is, is one that I built this morning, which is just to test that 2012 is a profit. I'm going to run those. Uh, oops, I should execute that. Okay, off it's going. So you can see it's, it's doing the test and it's doing the, the setup. It's running the actual test and then it's doing the teardown, tidying it of itself afterwards. And it's giving me all the results and I'm passing all of my tests. So I know my general ledger module is, is passing as I expected. Sometimes. Um, so as you can see here, one of my text tests has failed. So my, my test of 2012 profit has failed. Um, so I'm just gonna go into that and we can explain the components of that test with relation to, to what we talked about earlier. So here's my test. So my test name is test that 2012 is in profit, which I know it is, otherwise we've got a bit more of a problem than, than just this TI process. Uh, and my category is it's a general ledger test. Um, the execution of that, I'm going to do a few things. Um, so I'm not going to do anything in this setup. It doesn't need to load any data. The data is already loaded from a previous test and that that ran perfectly well. I'm not doing anything in the cleanup or the teardown section. It's it's just testing one thing and it's just testing a rule. So it's just testing a rule. There is nothing, no process to run. It doesn't kick off anything. It's just testing that. But the assertion in there, and there's only one assertion in this test, is its assertion a general ledger value, which is, is the name of the assertion that I call this. In that assertion, it's a compare cube cell value type. So I'm looking at the cell value in a cube and I'm comparing that to what I think it should be. The properties are obviously the address of that cell. So if I set that cell reference, we know it was looking at 2012, we know it's looking at profit, we know it's looking at all those things, um, which is okay. So that's the correct address of the cell that I wanna test. And it's just greater or, or greater than or equal to zero. It's in profit, it's just, all I know is it's something bigger than zero. That's all I know from the data. I don't know the exact number. I just know it's something bigger than zero. So we're failing on that test, and I want to go and find out why. I'm just going to close that. I'm just going to open up the general ledger cube. So here's the general ledger cube. It's 2012, total Europe. That's where I was supposed to be looking. And operating profit is actually not bigger than zero. Operating profit is now a million less than zero. Now, this is quite a common thing that I, you, you find when you're, you're building stuff. Somebody has amended the process to load debits and credits as opposed to revenue being positive and cost being negative. This is now showing revenue is negative and cost being positive. Common mistake that people make, and I wouldn't have picked that up had I not said it's greater than zero. It's obviously the right number. It's just the wrong, wrong way around. Now, we'd have to go and delve in and see why that is, um, but it's the wrong number. I'm going to go back to my test here. And open 2012 is in profit and it goes to my assertion I get edit this one assertion to say actually it's not greater than or equal to it should be less than or equal to because we are now building it the other way around I save that and I just rerun my tests okay so we run the same processes that we did before we're going to build the cost center we're going to build the account we're going to import the data import the assumptions and then my final test is I'm just going to test that that one number is now less than zero, not greater than zero. And as you can see, now that test passes. Now I need to go and have a word with the business and developer and, and, and decide whether or not that test is true, whether or not we are expecting it to be less than zero or greater than zero. Um, but the test now is replicable and I can keep executing that test again and again and again. Um, and I can come in tomorrow and just make sure that nobody's changed anything and I'm still getting the same results. 
Now, as I said, we want to make this easy for developers to do. So we're in Arc itself, and we can build the test and execute the test from Arc. But a quicker way of doing this might be to, to open the queue view, and you see the value here is January is minus 100, 560. Um, so if I just right click on that cell, uh, we've got to create a new test on the cell itself. So I can save a test from that cell. Uh, I'm just going to call this test something else. I'm going to call this test Jan 2012. Uh, I'm going to say this is a general ledger test because it is. And test Jan 2012 is less than 100K. About, uh, so that's what my test is going to be. Uh, Again, no setup, no execution. It's just a rule execute. I'm just making sure that that cell value is the same. I don't need to run anything before that or after that, but I could choose a process to run if I really wanted to. Uh, let's call this, uh, let's choose the bedrock. Uh, dim export. Where's bedrock dim export? Uh, there we go, bedrock dim export. Let's just export a dimension for the sake of it. Um, Export version, uh, export department. Uh, and then the teardown, we're not doing anything either. So we're going to run a process to do something. And then my assertion, uh, as you know, we came in from the cube cell value. Uh, so it knows the assertion is going to be a cell value. Um, and the assertion properties of that cell are the cell that I came in from. So I, I already chose January 2012. So we're at that starting point. We know what that starting point is. All I have to do now is say it should be less than OK, OK, and OK. And um, we can save that test. What did I call that? Just for safekeeping, I called it January 2012. OK, now my general ledger module, I just want to add that test to my general ledger module list of tests. So I'm just going to edit that and go to my entries. I'm just going to find that test that I called it. So January 2012, add that to my list of tests of general ledger module. So now we're getting more granular in the amount of tests that I'm doing for this module. Uh, and I'm going to execute that now. Yeah, I do want to execute all of them. So as we run through, it's doing the same test. It's repeating the tests and giving me the same results. So I know this is passing all the time. Uh, and I'm just adding another test onto it to, to make that test more accurate and more detailed the more I go. As you see with a lot of these that are executing a process, there's there's an implied test result in a process with a lot of these. So when we execute a TI process, one of the implied assertions that we're getting back at the moment is the process executed without any errors. So the implied uh, variable that we get back from process execution is a tick that process executed without any errors. We can add different assertions onto those as well to say things like, if I run this process with these parameters, I expect it to execute to finish with a process break, which is slightly different. The process itself might have failed, but the test is correct because the test is expecting the process to fail. So the implied variables that we're getting back from a, a TI process, more of which come later on in a different presentation, uh, those implied variables are in fact testable themselves, uh, as are anything else that you can test within a tier one model, really. Uh, Q value is the obvious one to test. Um, but you know, dimension hierarchies, um, actually rules themselves, you know, data within rules itself. You can write those tests and then test them again and again and again. And as I say, it's the replicable nature of that, the ability to string test together is trying to what we're trying to give developers with this, and the ability to, as I say, categorize and store them in pulse um, so that you can go into pulse later on, view the results of those tests, make sure that testing has been done so that you can control when things move from production. Uh, sorry, from development to production. Um, so there's lots more tests available for us to do. I could repeat these again, um, but yeah, just keep running your tests and making sure everything is okay. All right, that's uh, that's what I wanted to show you with a demo. Okay, and I stop sharing there. Cool. Okay, any questions there? Thanks, Ian. Uh, I have a question after this. Um, the feedback. Yeah, there you go. Feedback. Answer the feedback if you can. That would be much appreciated. Um, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, could you uh, combine together stuff like TI and the result of the TI with things like did the Python script execute properly and things like that? Or can you like if you're using TM1 Py for example? Yeah, I suppose the the return values are things that you have in your um, 
your TI process, if a Python file executed properly, you'd have to write back to TM1 to say that that thing executed properly it's itself because Python is seen outside of TM1. So you'd have to know what the result of that Python thing is going to be um, to return it back. So yes, possible if you know what that Python file is going to do. And how about something like if you were exporting your file, uh, could you check that the file, could you check that one of your tests, this, it actually creates the file in the first place, like file exists kind of thing? Yeah, so you have uh, file exists in the, the clean down as well. So the, uh -huh. the, the prolog, so the setup of the clean down, effectively execute unbound TIs. So you can do anything that you can do in a TI process in the prolog, you can check in the, the unbound TI as well, you can do anything you want in there as well. So you can do a file exists and then quit the unbound TI with a process break or a process quit or something like that. And you know that unbound TI failed so your process itself or your testing process itself implicitly fails as well or something like that so so yes anything that you think you can test in ti code itself or that we can test with the testing methods which are generally interpreting the model then yes yeah, testable okay cool and this is aimed at developers for checking their own work or people who are qa developers as well like who, who who do you think the end user is so for so so for everyone i, I suppose the developers, when they're developing stuff, are the right person to write the test. So yeah. you, you know what you're trying to build, you know the, the unit test that you're trying to do for that kind of stuff. For an end user, the way end users test system is slightly different. So yeah. the end users are coming in from, from the UI or wherever it is that the end users are coming in from, and they're not necessarily testing the execution of a process and the result of that process. They're testing their experience and things like that. So, yeah. so it may be that they look at something and go, my numbers are wrong, but that's part of the unit test of what those numbers should be, less of the user experience. So, so it's more aimed at developers for doing their testing for, for what they, they expect to happen with that unit. Cool, really cool. Um, and you said it was available this year, at some point? Yes, yes. So uh, I think it's, and Vincent might be on the call as well, but I think the next version of Arc Plus is due to be released next quarter. Um, so this will be in it. Uh, there's obviously more going on in the testing area that we're adding to our compulse as well. Um, so we're trying to make a whole testing suite available to them. But, but phase one is this unit testing stuff that we're releasing there. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Guido just asked, uh, would you run the tests only in dev? Um, it might be the issue, it might be an issue on prod and not on dev. How, how does it work? How would you work in there? So we, we, build, we built it so that tests are available to run as long as you can connect to that TM1 instance. So if I can connect to, to your production TM1 instance, you can run those tests on TM1. Obviously, the thing that you want to do is not mess up your data in production, which is why we do the setup and the, the clean down as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in theory, you should be able to migrate into production, run the same processes, and they have the same results. Um, so you should be able to, to, if you can connect to it, run them on it. But it's, it should be only the instances and the security that your user has got in Arc to run. So if you can't connect to production, you can't execute those tests in production. Cool. Vincent confirmed end of the year. So yes. good stuff. All right. Uh, well, I think that's it. We appreciate it. Thanks again. Okay. Is there another uh, question there? I think, I think just Anne Marie's very excited. So. Okay. There you go. Awesome. No Thank you. Uh, all right. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Yep. Appreciate okay. it. Uh, thank you, guys. See you again soon. See you soon. Have a good one.